Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Steve Rasner, and you're tuned in to the Lionhearted Dental Podcast. And yes, finally, I have a new podcast to offer you. I'm sorry. Here's the truth. I've been preparing for my live Lionhearted course in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is next weekend. And I poured my heart and soul out into this course, and it's taken every bit of my time. And I am so looking forward to it. We have some amazing dentists that are coming as far as way as Costa Rica and all over the United States. And uh, I, I think you can count on me having a second one. If you want to write to me, please do. Dr. Rasner at RasnerInstitute.com. And I'm planning on having it in the spring. So enough about me. That's why there's been a hiatus in my podcast. And I'm back on track. Uh, for the next several weeks, I have a lot of guests lined up. And tonight's guest, I want to tell you how this happened. So many of you will remember that I did a podcast about two months ago with Elijah Desmond on dentist. How do you transition when you want to sell your practice and move on? How do you do that? And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I didn't wasn't even sure that I wanted to do that podcast. And when I did it, I got a tremendous amount of email and feedback from colleagues all over the United States that asked me questions about it. And, you know, I know the guys, I know about the process because as many of you know already, I've gone through that process myself, but I went through it with one company and I don't know all the ins and outs. And so when I did that, one of the people I spoke to, who has become a very popular guest on this show, is no other than Dr. Vic Martell from Palm Beach, Florida. And Vic said, I got a guy you have to have on your show. And I said, okay, who, who's that? And he said, Brandon Moncrief. I said, who's that? And he said, he's been in it a long time. And I know from sp talking to Brandon several times at this point, that he's going to bring in his own approach, his own background to this. And I think it's going to help many of you because let me just say this. I'm not here tonight to encourage you or tell you to hop on the train. I have no agenda here. My only agenda ever in this podcast is to help you make good decisions. And apparently there's many more of you interested in the – when do, you, when do you get in? What do you do before you actually go out there and market your practice? All things I didn't know, by the way. So my guest tonight is Brandon Moncrief. Welcome, my friend. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anybody that Vic Martell tells me is a good man, he's a good man, as is my friend here, Brandon. So tell my audience, if you will, for a few seconds, you know, what's your background? How'd you get into this? So I've spent my entire professional career in the dental industry and in particular in mergers and acquisitions within the dental industry. So I have a finance degree. And when I came out of college, I went to work for a finance company that specialized in lending money to dentists all across the country uh, to acquire, start and expand their practices. So I spent about a decade there, worked my way up from an underwriter that would evaluate the financial health of a practice and uh, determine how much we wanted to lend a buyer to buy that asset. Uh, to where at the time I left the company 13 years ago as director of business development. And as the director of business development, my job was to build referral relationships with practice brokers, CPAs, attorneys across the country who could refer business to us. and. One of the brokers that I worked with was Paul McLaren in Austin, Texas. And when I wanted to leave lending, I approached Paul and he was ready to retire and I purchased the business from him. And he literally handed me the keys and said, uh, call me, but don't call me and uh, exited at that point. And uh, that was 13 years ago that I became the principal CEO of McLaren. And we built the company substantially since then. So we have really two divisions of our company. We have the legacy business that I acquired that does sell side representation brokerage for more traditional practice sales, doctor to doctor okay. transactions is what we call. And 
I really lead the other side of our company, which is the DSO and private equity division. And we expanded nationwide about five years ago and built out a team and a process to provide sell-side advisory to large practice owners who are looking to monetize all or a piece of their business by affiliating with a DSO or partnering with private equity. Um, so we've been involved in that space for the past five years, represented over 200 practices that have taken on a DSO or private equity partner. Um, and that's really the sandbox that I play in, you know, day to day helping doctors. One, like you mentioned earlier, get educated, right? What's your, what's your EBITDA? What's your practice worth? Private buyer versus DSO. Understand your why. And then once we've determined the value of the business, quantify the options available to you. And whatever path you want to go down, you want to sell to a private buyer, we can make sure that you crush it. You want to go down the DSO path, we're going to essentially create a bidding war among as many DSOs as possible to maximize the outcome when it comes to fit, deal structure, and valuation. Wow. If I wasn't, uh, if I wasn't already affiliated, I would, I got to be honest with you, that was a pretty impressive answer. Uh, I would call you. So listen, I want to say this again to you guys. I practiced 42 years before I affiliated. And not only did I wait 42 years, I I don't know if you know this about me, Brandon, but I was on the lecture circuit saying don't sell to DSOs. That was me. And listen, here's the reason I said it. Because it's my belief system and it still is to a point that it's not good for dentistry that you know I, I came from an old school mentality trained by people like Frank Spear John Coy's Pete Dawson Carl Misch you know I wasn't ever thinking about I mean it I wasn't maybe it's silly of me to have been that way but I wasn't thinking about monetizing and if I learned this and I grow my practice to this, I'll be able to do that. I wasn't thinking about that. I was seriously thinking that I just cared about my reputation in my community and being a great dentist. So when I got to the point if later in my career, I realized that if I went the traditional way, I would just leave so much money on the table that I wasn't willing to do that. I mean, I don't know how to say this to you other than to be patently honest. I I have my philosophy of what dentistry should be, and that has not changed. That said, I'm not going to leave millions of dollars on the table to stick to that philosophy. I was I'm, call me a sellout. So I'm sure I'm sure some of you won't mind saying that. That said, I, I have learned something, Brandon, that I'm going to ask you about, and I'm sure you're an expert at it way more than I am. I didn't know that there were different personalities of DSOs, just like there are dentists. So I thought they all just wanted to cut us up, make us take third-party insurance, expand, expand, expand. And that's just not true. There are different DSOs and the one I actually affiliated with has stuck to the word. They've been pretty, not pretty, they've been completely hands off. So I've been able to do everything the way I used to do it, up to a couple differences that I'm sure he can enlighten us on tonight. So here's my first question to you. I mean, I told you why I just saw. Why, why is it that so many dentists, I, you know what, Brandon? I thought it was going to go away. I didn't think the tsunami of affiliation with DSOs would actually work and stay. So how did it get so big in the last five years? Why are so many dentists in this space right now? What do you think? It's a great question. I think it's a, a combination of things. So, you know, like you, when I saw DSOs come to into our backyard mm -hmm. and being based in Texas, a lot of the DSO consolidation kind of started here. Arizona, Texas, Florida, the Southeast. And we pounded the table for a couple of years and said, no way in hell are we gonna sell any of our practices to DSOs. And like you, I also thought that it wasn't legitimate 
it wasn't going to stick around. It was a fad that was gonna build up and fall apart relatively quickly. But what we realized is that for multiple reasons, a lot of our potential clients that we thought we would eventually sell to clinicians decided to pull the trigger and affiliate with the DSO. Now, many of those people didn't fully understand their why. They either sold prematurely, sold to the wrong DSO, or left a lot of money on the table because they didn't navigate the process uh, properly. Um, but one of the big reasons that we felt it became a legitimate option is because the DSO model evolved from kind of what you described previously. DSO version 1.0, the suits made all the decisions. They weren't focused on clinical autonomy nor uh, clinical quality. They were just focused on profit. They didn't allow the doctors to participate in the, the equity side, the arbitrage side, the gain that the investors were recognizing. They just treated doctors as employees, not partners. They didn't value staff. And it was a volume game. That was DSO version 1.0. And in large part, that version of DSOs did crash and burn. And then DSO version 2.0, a much more legitimate transition option for our clients emerged. And that's where they only buy practices. Typically, they don't start practices from scratch. They buy profitable businesses from great clinicians and simply support them behind the veil from an administrative perspective and then utilize their leverage, their economies of scale to just turn the dial slightly and increase profit substantially without interrupting the clinical autonomy, the culture of the business, without rebranding it. DSO version 2.0, private equity got smart. They realized that you know trying to buy a practice and reverse engineer uh, a certain outcome was uh, a losing proposition. But if they bought good practices and just supported their culture, supported them behind the veil, there was still a lot of money to be made without reverse engineering you know, reinventing the, the wheel. And that's when I think DSO, to some people still a four letter word, but to many it's not anymore. And it's become a more legitimate option. So there's several reasons why our clients choose to affiliate with a DSO. And, and most of the time it's multifaceted. So one is the economics, right? I mean, we just sold a practice in Florida. We closed a couple of weeks ago, $7 million top line revenue, $1.5 million in EBITDA, and it traded for $13 million. Well, that practice, if you were to try to sell it to a private buyer, would be nearly impossible to sell. Right. And if it was valued at more of a traditional doctor to doctor valuation on a good day, it might sell for five or $6 million versus $13 yeah. million in the DSO space. So the DSO deal has more structure to it, right? It's not gonna be 100% cash at close, but in that situation, the cash at close was substantially higher than a private buyer would be willing or able to pay. And then our doctor has significant retained equity. They're a true partner in the practice on a go forward basis. So one is the economics, just the delta between the private buyer valuation and the yeah. DSO valuation. It can be millions and millions of dollars where practices trade for 80 to 90% of revenue in the private buyer world they can trade for as high as 300 or 400% of revenue in the DSO world. So that's you know one consideration. The other thing that private equity smartly did was allow doctors to hold equity, whether that's equity at the practice level or the parent company level, and basically invest alongside the private equity sponsor and enjoy the profits that they're generating on that equity if and when they hit a recap, hopefully at a handsome return. Um, so because of the mark difference in valuation, because of the wealth creation opportunity associated with the equity, because these DSOs are not interrupting the clinical autonomy and allowing the doctor to really keep a lot of, you know, operational autonomy for that reason, it became a lot more palatable for dentists to look, to go down that path. And then later on a massive increase in the burden of management, especially post COVID as it applies to yeah. the HR nightmare that all of you have been dealing with post COVID. So private practice has had some headwinds, some pretty strong headwinds 
even though private practice has continued to thrive in, in some regard, there's been some headwinds that, that y'all had to face and DSOs are better insulated. They're really built to push against those headwinds. So for that reason, the fact that a lot of doctors are experiencing burnout, you know, or they just want to get the administrative burden off their plate, they want access to those economies of scale, that's another big driver for a lot of our clients. So it's kind of a balance between, you know, economics, right, a higher valuation, the equity upside, the wealth creation opportunity, de-risking by pulling some equity out of their business because a lot of doctors, the majority of their net worth is tied up in their practice, a business that has a lot of key man risk, and then getting some help from an administrative perspective. So I want to say two things about what Brandon just said. And, you know, you're, it's so obvious you've been in this space because you're saying it somewhere eloquently than I am. So I'm saying this right now because I know many of you have followed my philosophy of practice for many years. And I'm very blessed and fortunate to have many of you believe in me. And again, like I have no agenda except to share with you and save you time. So here's why I'm saying this. Those of you that have followed the Lionhearted Principles and your practice went, I, had, I know a fella in the state of Washington that went from uh, about to, re, to burn out, about to quit, to... He was at 1.8, he went to 2.5, he went to 4 million. It was after he heard me speak, by the way. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm responsible, but he says I am. And now he's at 750,000 a month. So when you have success uh, that's more than, in my mind, two, three, four, five million, who's, who is it going to, who, who would follow the traditional sell model that Brandon was referring to because you're not going to get that money. Nobody can afford it. Who's going to give even two 30 year olds what's 750 times 12? It's 750, 800 plus million. I mean, excuse me, 8 million plus per year. Where is a young 29, 35 year old going to get an institution to lend the money to give you what you're going to get from that, from equity. So that's kind of what I was facing. It's 9 million, by the way. My trusted videographer and mathematician, Tony, just told me. And so it, I'm just being serious with you. It's pretty hard to walk from that. And so what, do you, what did I do? What would I recommend you do? I would vet it out. I would take my time and get somebody. What's my true EBITDA? which we're going to get into here. I look at more than one company and find one hopefully that matches and preserves your legacy as close as it can. And the second point that you brought up is you're right. Like I was, I felt like I was the Wizard of Oz when it came to managing my uh, team. And post COVID, something changed. You know, having people call out having less, uh, trying to find new staff. Everything has become 10x more complicated in running a practice. So think about it. And I don't, I said already, so I'm not here to encourage you. I'm just trying to, maybe I'm trying to rationalize for so many people that heard me talk down to affiliating how it happened for me. And that is you get the right payday for what you probably have worked way harder than the average dentist your whole life. You know, you. I gave up a great part of my life to establish this practice that I had to sell. And I should get paid for that. I am. I, I mean, I, I did. And I think you should do the same, but you better be careful in who you select. And then if you could do that and not have to worry about all the management that seems to be in the way post-COVID, it's hard to turn that down. All right, here's my next question. I affiliated in 2022. I believe interest rates were, well, I know they were significantly less than today. And I've heard that evaluations may be impacted by that. So what are you hearing out there today? For those colleagues of mine that are saying, hey, I, 
I want to, I'm interested, but what's going on today? So the elevated interest rate environment, because private equity does apply a lot of leverage to these businesses, it does impact to some degree demand and valuation. So valuations really reached a high watermark in 21 and 22. Dentistry was already in favor among private equity. It was one of the hottest verticals that private equity was investing in going into COVID. And dentistry had proven to be kind of a perfect ideal environment for private equity investment. And it had proven to be recession proof time and time again. And then it proved to be pandemic proof and private equity doubled down, right? Those DSOs that were already buying practices started buying them at an even faster clip in 21 and 22. Those private equity firms that didn't yet own a DSO pulled the trigger, bought a platform and started building a DSO. And in doing so, when demand increased substantially, valuations increased substantially, and they were still operating in an ideal macroeconomic environment with very low interest rates and availability of capital. I mean, the capital markets were, were wide open. So money was easy to get and it was cheap. Mm -hmm. And the market was very frothy as a result of that. But as a result of that, a lot of DSOs didn't use a lot of discipline in what they were buying. They were overpaying for practices. And when interest rates really doubled almost overnight, uh, a lot of DSOs were kind of caught with their pants down, if you will. They didn't plan for, they didn't have a rainy day fund. They weren't planning for a massive change in the macroeconomic environment. Money became expensive and hard to get. And if you were over your skis from a leverage perspective or over your skis operationally, which many of them were because they grew so rapidly in 21 and 22, you had to go on pause, right? You got the red light from your bank, you tripped your loan covenants and you could no longer buy practices. So as a result, over the past 24 months, a lot of the DSOs that were stupid aggressive in 21 and 22 have been on hold, not buying offices. Now you would think that that would have a marked impact on valuation and demand, but what happened was a lot of entrepreneurial doctors that were building practices with the goal of selling them yeah. to a DSO or private equity, they took on a financial sponsor in 21 and 22, and they've kind of stepped up to fill the void that some of these other DSOs that have been on pause left in the marketplace. So demands actually remain relatively steady. It's not the same set of buyers bidding on practices today that were bidding on offices you know, two, three, four years ago, it's a different mix. There's some of the same players in the marketplace, but a lot of them are newer, smaller, medium-sized DSOs that are not over levered. They're not over their skis operationally because they were not buying. Part of that, yeah. yeah, they were not part of that wave of consolidation that happened in 21 and 22. So when we talk about class A assets, uh, when we're talking about multi-doc practices, multi-million dollar revenue, you know, EBITDA of 700,000 plus, the demand's there and the valuations are there. There hasn't been a big drop off or compression in valuations. To say that any compression you've seen in the marketplace, it's on smaller practices with EBITDA of less than 500,000 and very, very large platforms with the EBITDA of over 5 million. It's just hard to secure uh, debt at that level. So many of the institutional investors have been waiting for interest rates to come down before they start acquiring platforms again at 10, 11, 12 times EBITDA. Um, and now we're kind of moving past the environment that we've been in the past 24 months. Capital markets are starting to open back up. Interest rates are starting to come down. I think you'll see some recapitalization events happen over the next six to 12 months while they've been you know, kind of on pause or been muted due to the interest rate environment over the past 24 months, you're going to see some recaps happen. You're going to see private equity enter the picture. And I think the market's going to, you know, boom, you're going to see a lot more acquisitory activity from private equity and DSOs moving into 2025 and 2026. It's not going to be as frothy and as crazy it was in 21 and 22, but it's going to be a, a lot more favorable environment for private equity on the go forward because the interest rates are now coming down and the capital markets are opening back up. Well, every dentist that has entered this space in any way is wondering in his mind, because he knows about a guy like me or his friend in Midwest or California that got a multiple of blank. And I know even from my own 
talks and conversations with colleagues that the multiples haven't been as strong. What are you seeing today? What's the range? Range, I mean, it's rare that we sell a practice for under seven times EBITDA. You know, people will say the multiples are four or five or six yeah. times EBITDA. By the way, those people are typically the DSOs, right? Private equity has wanted the multiples to soften and they can use the interest rates as an excuse to pay less. But the reality is because the demand's still so high, there's so many DSOs buying practices that if you run the process properly, you have a good sell side advisor, you create a competitive environment for your practice, you're gonna end up with a premium. And if you've got a class A asset, you're gonna trade for somewhere likely between seven to nine times EBITDA, depending on the different aspects of the practice, how large the practice is, you know, the key man risk, the geography, the growth potential, your runway post sale, you know, you're gonna see a higher multiple if you've got a longer runway as opposed to a shorter runway. There's a lot of different factors that impact the multiple. Uh, but I think this is a good time to also mention, everybody wants to talk about the multiples. M the multiple matters. EBITDA matters more than the multiple. Every dollar of EBITDA is worth seven to nine dollars in value. Right. So the number one way that DSOs are predatory and are let's just say opportunistic, right? Okay. Their goal is to buy low and sell high, buy the practice for as low as I can pay for it and sell it for as much as I can pay for it at a recap event. The number one way to manipulate valuation is to manipulate the EBITDA, not the multiple. So for instance, let's just say you've got a practice where the DSO says, hey, your EBITDA is you know, $500,000 and we're gonna dangle the carrot of a sexy multiple at 7X. So that's a three and a half million dollar valuation. But then you get in touch with me, I say, hey, hit pause on that conversation with that DSO. They're not going anywhere. They might threaten to leave the table, but they won't. I know they won't. Let us do an, uh, our own independent EBITDA valuation. And oftentimes what we find is EBITDA is not $500,000, EBITDA is $700,000. And trading at a 7X multiple, that would be a $4.9 million valuation. So they're trying to rip you off for a million and a half dollars. And our job is to make sure that we control the narrative regarding EBITDA and get you credit for every dollar of EBITDA that you're due and then create that highly competitive environment to move the multiple. So if I can move the EBITDA by a hundred to $200,000, even if I only move the multiple by half a turn, there's yeah. an exponential return on investing in hiring us. Beautiful, that's, I mean, let me take you back, me back. Let's pretend I did not affiliate in 2022 and I'm still here right now in October, 2025, four, October, 2024. What are the differences you're seeing out there from different DSO buyers or deal structures available in today's market? A couple of changes over the past, I'd say 24 to 36 months. Uh, one is that DSOs have recognized that doctor turnover, in particular founder turnover is their Achilles heel. So they prefer that the seller is available to have a vested interest in the business for a longer time frame, typically five years, whereas it used to be two to three years. Right. But it comes with more autonomy, less guardrails. Like you don't have to work chair side at all. Um, so as long as you help manage the business and as long as the business performs well, you can backfill your production with associates and you have the ability to step away chair side. Whereas it used to be two to three year commitment, but you had to work a certain number of days a week or a month right. and produce at a certain clip in order for your relationship to be kosher. Um, so that's been one change. They want a longer runway uh, post sale. The other thing is that they want alignment of incentive, typically both at the parent company level of the DSO and at the practice level. So how do you align incentive at the practice level? In other words, if I'm gonna buy your practice and you don't hold any equity in your own business, you only hold equity in the DSO, well, what's the incentive for you to continue to work hard in your own practice when you can just assume that all your other partners are working hard and you get kind of a free rider problem, right? The incentives are not aligned at the practice level. So there's been a move towards a joint venture equity structure where 
you monetize a piece of the business at close, let's say 60 to 70% of the business, but then from an equity perspective, you still have 20 to 40% equity at the practice level. And you might have some holding company stock as well. Um, so the joint venture model where it's cash and practice level equity, or the hybrid model where it's cash, stock in the DSO and practice level equity, that's a more popular model today than it was a few years ago. It's a model that MB2 in large part pioneered. Um, they're kind of now the 800 pound gorilla in the joint venture world. But it allows for incentive, uh, alignment of incentive at the practice level so that doctors keep their foot on the gas because they share in the ongoing EBITDA of the business. And then when a recap occurs, their proceeds are predicated upon the EBITDA multiple the DSO is trading for and the practice level EBITDA. So you grow your EBITDA, you grow the value of your business. And it has an exponential return because while you might sell for 7x at the initial transaction, the DSO is trading for 12 to 15 times EBITDA. Um, so those have been a couple of the mark changes. And because the capital markets have been tight, because leverage has been difficult to access and more expensive, DSOs are trying to make their cash go further. So you were seeing transactions a few years ago, you know, 80% cash yeah. at close. Now today, I'd say the average cash at close falls in the 60 to 70% range with 60 being kind of more of the norm. And you have seen some like holdbacks and earnouts start to creep back into the deal structures. By creating a competitive environment, working with somebody like us, we negotiate those out of the deals. Um, but again, DSOs are trying to pull levers to help them reserve cash because they just have less cash available to invest. Again, I think that's going to change over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, but those have been several of the changes that we've seen in the deal structures over the past couple of years. Okay, well, there's probably every bit of 10,000 people that are going to plus see this. What I'm sure they all want to know, what should I not do when I take this leap? And does this even a thing? Like, I had dinner Monday night with a colleague who's 39 and has $10 million in revenue. He's basically an all-on practice. And he's in the process of potentially transitioning now, selling. I mean, is there an age you tell them not? Like, cool your jets, does that have nothing to do with it? Uh, what are the mistakes that my friends want to know about? You gotta get educated, right? And when it comes to like age, we talk a lot about runway, right? Runway to exiting your business. That doesn't necessarily have anything to do with age because you know, we're seeing younger and younger doctors decide to sell their business for one reason or the other. Whether they want administrative help, whether they want to de-risk and take some chips off the table, whether they plan to sell their business, fulfill their post-closing commitment, and then build another business, whether that be in dentistry or otherwise. But you've got to get educated. You've got to understand what is your practice worth and what are your options. And that's always step one in our process. A few things you need to be aware of is that DSOs have built marketing machines designed to solicit large practice owners to enter into a conversation without advisors at the table. Again, the goal there is to control the narrative regarding your options, your EBITDA, your valuation. Well, you don't want the buyer controlling that narrative. Otherwise, you have a high probability of getting screwed. So don't accept an unsolicited offer. You've got to create optionality. You've got to create perspective and you've got to create leverage. And the only way to do that is to date around, to entertain multiple offers, interest from multiple buyers simultaneously and do that in what we call a blind bid process. So we do evaluation pre-market to educate our client, set expectations, and really decide, is it appropriate for them to go down this path? Okay. It's a private conversation between us and the doctor. How do you determine, like say it's a, a, Dr. X, he reaches out to you. He's probably gonna reach out to you after this podcast. Is that a, I'm, I'm just being genuine when I'm asking you this. He wants to know what a Zibida relatively is. What's that process? Does he cost X to do that? I mean, what, what's, how's that work? 
So our fee to do an EBIT analysis and evaluation, nominal fee is 2,500 bucks. And it's credited to our commission if and when we consummate a sale down the road. And that process is designed to educate you regarding your EBITDA, the value of your business and your options. We have a CPA on staff. We have financial analysts on staff. We're very sophisticated when it comes to the financial part of this conversation, because look, that's a huge driver, you know, for people looking to go down the DSO private equity road. So 2,500 bucks, it normally takes three weeks to knock out. We go over the EBIT analysis and evaluation together, and we can also do some economic modeling to show you under certain assumptions, right? At this valuation, under these three different deal structures, here are the global economic implications of pursuing a sale. You know, cash at close, annual compensation, and then your return at a potential recap at a modest outcome, right? Get you educated first. And the valuation conversation is a private conversation really designed to align expectations, right? right. You know, if I tell you, Steve, your, your practice is worth 8 million, but you want 15 million for it, well, let's not waste everybody's time and go to market because we're never gonna get 15 million. Right. But we'll set an off-market, pre-market, private expectation with you that, hey, Steve, I think we can get 8 million for your practice. Um, but when we take the practice to market, we're gonna run what we call a blind bid process. So we actually create a true bidding war among DSOs. They're not gonna ever know that we set that baseline expectation at 8 million. If I can get 9 million, 10 million, 11 million, I'm gonna get it. That process is designed so that we don't leave a dollar of value on the table. Um, and m the vast majority of the time, we're going to exceed the valuation expectation that we set with our client. So the key is to get educated, have great advisors around you, create a highly competitive environment for your practice, control the narrative regarding EBITDA, and create the leverage and optionality you need to make a good decision, find the right partner, negotiate the right deal structure, and maximize the valuation. And everybody gets so caught up on the valuation, it's definitely important. But because there's an equity component, because you're gonna be there for three to five years, fit and deal structure are equally as important, if not more important, than the uh, initial valuation. And just to show you how opportunistic DSOs are, I'll use kind of a, an example. So, and I can tell this story over and over and over again about 30, 40 different clients. Because oftentimes our clients are already in conversations with the DSO at the time they engage us. This particular client in Atlanta already had an offer in hand from a legitimate DSO at 6.5 million. His top line revenue was 3.5 million very healthy EBITDA of 1.2 million. Now he thought, well, I mean, my alternative here is to sell to a private buyer. A private buyer would probably only pay 2.7 million, 2.8 million on a good day. I've got an offer at 6.5 million from a legitimate DSO. This sounds almost too good to be true. And his attorney wisely said, hey, before you ink that offer, call Brandon, let his team do an independent EBITDA analysis and evaluation. And he wisely did. And we said, hey, doc, we think we can get you 8 million for your practice. And he was skeptical, but he hired us. And we gave the DSO he was already talking to a seat at the table, but we filled the table with other DSOs. And we ended up getting seven offers. And that practice ultimately traded for over $10 million. Wow. Wow. Guess who it yeah. sold to? It sold to the same DSO that made the unsolicited $6.5 million offer. Wow. His offer went up over 50% simply by holding their feet to the fire and running a competitive process and having a good advisor. If that doesn't show you how opportunistic DSOs are, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what will, but that's how, that's how the, the world works. It's a cost average game for them. They're going to buy 10 practices. They're going to buy seven of them directly from doctors that don't have representation for an under market valuation. The three they buy through us, they can afford to overpay for because it's a cost average game. If they've underpaid for seven, they can overpay for the other three. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolute sense. Um, and I get it because I know, look, a lot of dentists, especially guys from my generation, you have worked a very long time. You, for lack of a better expression, are literally tired and you're kind of ready to get out. I get it.
And in your brain, just like mine, all these years, you were thinking, hey, my practice grossed 4 million last year. You know, maybe I can get two, five, three. Maybe I get four if I get two buyers that will collaborate together. And then somebody comes along and offers you six. And it's so tempting because it's so significantly more than you had anticipated in your brain. Don't do that. You know, due diligence to the very fact that I'm bringing you a second guide tonight. It's two of I don't know how many on this show. Due diligence to it. Talk to more than one person. Your practice, if it's worth it, it'll be there. The, the, the person that's offering you the money, though, as Brandon said, they're not going anywhere. So do respect the lifetime of dedication that you put into this to be in a position to sell big. And don't do what I did. And i like you to comment on this. When I was negotiating in the beginning, I kept reminding them how great I was, me, that I could do any everything. I can do periodontal procedures. I can do oral surgical procedures. I can do this, I can do that. Guess what I was setting up? Everything revolved around me. And if I had to... Correct. So my attorney got a hold of me before too much time had elapsed and told me to, to basically told me to shut up and remind them that I have associates that can do procedures. Here's my takeaway for real. I don't know where you're at in your journey. I don't know where you're at in your career. But if you're in the best thing you could ever do on many levels, not even just the level of selling to a DSO is invest the time and money in a good associate to train. Even if you lost them, you can't take the you can't take the road of being fearful of training and investing a quality associate because you're scared they'll leave you and not be with you. In fact, if you're fair to them and you do invest in them, and the relationship is authentic, I, and that includes what they're getting paid. You are setting yourself up in the opposite direction to build this empire that everybody wants. You know, everybody wants the office that's got key associates that can basically do what you do. Why wouldn't they want that? Am I right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, bifurcating the key man risk by spreading production among multiple providers will 100% increase the value of your practice. It's likely going to increase your EBITDA and it's definitely going to increase your multiple. So let's wrap this up with this. I appreciate, I know you're on a flight today and I do really appreciate you enlightening me and it's too late for me, but it's not too late for you guys. How do you, where does this go in? Where's this consolidation of our industry? It's obviously not going to end. Is it going to accelerate? What do you see? And how many, how many dentists are affiliated now? If there's a percentage that you know about, and how many are still independent? So great questions and you know nobody has a crystal ball, but private equity is going to continue to consolidate our industry. Uh, if you're you know in these echo chambers that you know some of these DSOs create, they'll tell you that they're taking over the world and that private practice is doomed and that the industry is already 40% consolidated. But the ADA just released statistics that 15% of dentists currently work for DSOs. So I would argue that we're only in the, the second or third inning of the consolidation wave. So the wave slowed down over the past 18 to 24 months due to the, the macroeconomic conditions we've talked about. Uh, but those are gonna ease over the next 24 months and you're gonna see more and more consolidation. It's not gonna go back to being as crazy as it was in 21 and 22, but it's going to accelerate above and beyond how it's been the past 18 to 24 months. Eventually, seven to 10 years from now, we will hit a tipping point. And I think that's around 60%, 65% consolidation where you know, the majority of the really large practices have affiliated with a DSO. They've been acquired by private equity. And at that tipping point, I think you're gonna see, there's not gonna be a lot of new private equity capital enter our industry because 
there's not enough meat left on the bone for them to hit multiple recap events and generate the yeah. the crazy amount of, of arbitrage and gain that they've generated you know up until that point so at that point you're going to start to see some consolidation of the consolidators you're going to see dso's start to merge and there may only end up with you know 20 to 30 really really large dso's and i think there'll always be an aspect of private practice but i think private practice in order to thrive long term has to evolve and you have to in, to some degree emulate what the dso's are doing and what i mean by that is group practice multiple doctors larger facility multi-million dollar revenue you've got to insulate yourself from some of the headwinds that that dentistry uh is facing and the way to do that is through size uh and whether that be general dentistry practices or going multi-specialty um i think that private practice has got to evolve in that manner to thrive long term you know the days of the the four op practice doing six hundred and fifty thousand dollars in top line revenue we are currently going through a mass extinction event where those practices will not exist when we get to that seven to ten year mark dentistry will not be profitable with that model sure. that has survived for the past you know 50 years um so i, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch it evolve but private equity is not going anywhere dso's aren't going anywhere you know, they're here to stay. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why I think it's so important to get educated about what's happening in the industry and understand your options and, you know, pull the trigger at, at the right time. You know, whether that's today or 10 years from now, I think you just need to, to quantify what's possible early and plan in advance. Well, I got to thank you, Brandon. This has been enlightening, fascinating to me. I mean it. I, I'm listening to you for the last 30, 40 minutes, and I'm, I'm wishing I had had this information before I went on my journey. I, I feel it would have benefited me greatly, and I, I know you're going to help a lot of my friends and colleagues that listen to the Lionhearted, and that's the only reason I do this. So everybody, I'm going to see you next week. Uh, you can reach out to me or Brandon directly, directly for more information. We'll have the uh, contact information. I. I have a lot of great lineups coming your way in the next week after week after week. So tune in. See you next week on the Lionhearted.